Hello there, Mr. P here, uh, and today is Chapter 7, Lecture 7, and in this lecture we're going to talk a little bit about cell membranes, what it means to be a membrane, how the membrane acts, how it's structured, um, and how that structure allows for compartmentalization, specifically in a eukaryote, meaning how organelles came to be, how organelles can have specific functions, um, and, and what the membrane does for the cell. Okay, so let's get started. Cell membranes are composed of phospholipids, first of all, and phospholipids are the main component of any cell membrane. Okay, and so when we look at any cell membrane, phospholipids are by far the most important molecule because they are the thing or the molecule that is actually producing the membrane. And if you remember from chapter two, a phospholipid is a phosphate head with two fatty acid tails and the head is polar and the tails are nonpolar and the head is hydrophilic and the tails are hydrophobic and so the phospholipid bilayer is going to orient itself like this where the tails are together and the heads are together because on the outside of this membrane and on the inside of the membrane meaning on the outside of the cell and the inside of the cell um, there will be water because there's water in the environment there's water in the cell and there is no water in this region okay this is a zone of hydrophobicity meaning it's a hydrophobic zone um, and because the tails are both nonpolar they're going to obviously orient themselves away from water and orient themselves towards each other okay? and so we'll get into a little bit more about that later um, but that's just a quick review of chapter two and a little review about those individual organ uh, or individual molecules. So membrane function, um, we have already dis established that the, the membrane is composed of phospholipids and it's specifically composed of two layers of phospholipids. Remember the, the phospholipids are arranged in a bilayer and the, the, the bilayer is really important because it allows for water to be both on the outside and inside of a cell. Um, we know that water is essential to life, and we live as, as multicellular organisms and cellular organisms. We live in an environment on Earth that contains a large percentage of water, both in the atmosphere and in liquid form. Um, and in a cell, there's a, there's a large percentage of water as well. Okay? And it's the bilayer that allows both cells to be in an environment of water and contain water without actually... Um, you know, without actually ruining the cell membrane. Okay, so the bilayer is really important. There is a particular function of the cell membrane, and it's to regulate both um, or maintain a boundary from inside and outside of the cell, and to regulate materials that are going to leave or exit, um, exit or enter a cell. Okay, so two functions of the cell membrane. One, maintain a boundary between inside and out. It is the border between inside and outside of a cell. And because it's that fence, so to speak, it regulates what goes in and out. Um, how does a fence regulate what goes in and out? Well, there are gates that will allow you to take things into a fence or through a fence that, that limits things by size. You obviously can possibly take a lawnmower through a gate in your backyard, um, but you can't drive a car through that gate to get into your backyard. Now, a car could probably end up in your backyard by going straight through the fence um, but that's not what the fence is intended to do. The fence is designed to keep things out but you put a gate in so that not only you can fit through and, and go through but you can take things of wanted size through. This is an image that shows you the structure of a membrane. Now we've in that first slide I kind of drew out uh, the membrane and so remember we have hydrophilic heads which are polar, and we have hydrophobic tails, which are nonpolar, and we have water on, let's just say this is the inside, and we have water, we'll just say this is the outside, um, but we have water on the inside and outside of a cell, but we do not have water, I'm just going to say no water, on the inside of this membrane between heads. This is a hydrophobic zone, no water zone, and if you remember from chapter two, we talked about phospholipids being amphipathic. 
And amplopathic is a term used to describe special molecules that exhibit both a hydrophobic and hydrophilic section, or it's a molecule that has both polar and nonpolar regions. Um, a water molecule is not amplopathic because the water molecule as a whole is polar. A methane molecule is nonpolar as an entire molecule, and so it is not said to be amplopathic. But because the phospholipid has both a polar region here and a nonpolar region on the same molecule, it's said to be amplopathic. Um, but cell membranes are found in eukaryotic and uh, prokaryotic cells. Um, but we're going to talk in terms of eukaryotic cells uh, for the rest of this chapter. Remember, prokaryotes have a cell membrane, but they typically always have a cell wall on the outside of that. Um, and they can be gram-negative and gram-positive, which kind of doesn't mean much to us in this class. But prokaryotes can have a, a, a difference in how that cell wall is structured. Again, this, the polysaccharide component of that cell membrane is uh, peptidoglycan. Um, but the phospholipid that is found in eukaryotic cells is structured just like this, where heads are on the outside and inside, and, um, and the tails are between those heads. Membrane pranks. Hey guys, look, I have a water gun. And everyone in that row freaks out and all the tails move away because the tails are polar, uh, or excuse me, the tails are nonpolar, and the water that is in the water gun is, is polar. And um, if you were to somehow inject water into the interior of a membrane, you would literally blow a hole in that membrane. Um, and so bringing a water gun to to a membrane would not be a good thing. <clears throat> membrane is a barrier. So these are things that um, you might experience if you're a cell membrane. Um, there are things that can go through, as seen here and here. There are things that cannot go through, which are seen here and here. So what is the difference? The difference is these things are small important. Small molecules can fit through the spaces between membranes. Larger things cannot fit through. Um, again, that gate idea, it, it holds, holds true here. Larger molecules or larger items than your gate is wide will not fit through the gate and will be rejected by the fence, by the gate, or by the membrane. And so larger molecules cannot fit through while smaller molecules can. Now, not all small water or small water molecules can. Um, small, uncharged, or polar molecules can go through, and they typically require the use of a protein. Um, like water will flow through a small channel protein called an aquaporin. Um, but these things are small, uncharged, or polar molecules. They can go through, but they typically require a protein or some kind of pump. And the small hydrophobic molecules don't need a pump. They just can diffuse through. They can just fit through. Now, why would a hydrophobic molecule not disrupt the tails as they go through while a small polar molecule would disrupt the tails? And the answer is the tails are nonpolar. And so the, the nonpolar hydrophobic tails will mix well with the small hydrophobic molecules. So they just squeeze through. They don't disrupt anything the small polar molecules will disrupt the membrane because remember, just like water, we said, um, will disrupt the membrane tails. And so they can't just squeeze through, even though they're small enough, because they would disrupt the inner section of this membrane. And so they require the use of a protein. Now, amino acids, glucose, nucleotides, these things are actual monomers. Those should, those should look familiar from chapter 2. And they are too large to fit through the membrane. And so they are going to either need a larger channel protein or they're going to have to be broken down into individual components before they're allowed to be transported through. Ions, again, aren't that big. In fact, H plus is just a proton. That's like the smallest particle we know other than a, an electron. Um, but an H plus proton, an H plus ion, is charged. And so because these are charged, they are, they're not going to go through. They're going to be rejected. And so... Um, we're going to get into the transport mechanisms of a cell 
but these ions will pass through, but it typically requires energy. Um, and we'll talk specifically about a sodium potassium pump. And so these potassium and sodium ions will move through the membrane, but it requires a protein, it requires a pump, and it requires energy. Okay, and so over here is a little bit of information. One idea that's really important is this idea of selectively permeable or selective permeability. Um, and I want you to remember a strainer. I think everybody's used a strainer at some point. You're making, you know, your world famous mac and cheese. Um, you will boil the noodles, you'll cook them, and then you'll put them through a strainer, at least I do, because, you know, the water's hot and you don't want to just try to use a spoon, because anytime I think that I'm going to be, like, perfect this time at holding all the noodles back, I always lose half the pot or something. So, you just dump the pot of boiling water and noodles that are perfectly cooked through a strainer, and that strainer works really good at allowing certain things to go through, i.e. the water, and not allowing certain things to go through, i.e. the pasta, based purely on size. Water is much smaller than the pasta, and so water slips right through the holes, while the pasta does not. Um, and that would be a perfect example of this, right? Pasta is a large molecule. It is not allowed to go through, while water is allowed to go through because they're small. Okay, so proteins within phospholipid allow some things to pass freely, um, and some materials pass due to their charge or polarity. These things can move through, but like I said, they typically require a protein like it discusses here. So to sum it up, while others are kept from moving across the membrane, specifically these, um, based on their size, polarity, or charge, some can go through without based on their size, polarity, and charge. These are small, uncharged, and polar, or nonpolar. They can go through, while the large polar or charged ionic uh, compounds can uh, cannot go through. Polarity joke. The polar bear falls into the water and says, help, help, I'm dissolving. And then the grizzly bear, which is looking at him, kind of awkwardly says, but bears are insoluble, meaning they can't be dissolved. And the polar bear says, that's easy for you to say, you're not polar. <laughs> what does polar mean? Polar means that you dissolve in water because water is what? Polar. So polar molecules dissolve in polar water. So polar bears dissolve in water. Not really. But he thought he was. Anyway, membrane is a barrier. Transport proteins. Um, there are specific transport proteins that are going to transport substances. And uh, these transport proteins allow some materials to go through that can't normally go through the membrane by themselves. Okay, The only way some materials can get through the membrane is through a channel protein or transport protein. Channel protein is exactly what it sounds like. It goes all the way through the bilayer, kind of like a tube, and it creates a passageway from inside to out or outside to in, and is always or generally selective to size or charge, meaning that a sodium ion will not be allowed to pass through the same tube as a water molecule will because a water molecule is not charged and a sodium ion is. Um, while a water molecule and sodium ion are virtually the same size, I mean obviously sodium ion is going to be much smaller than a water molecule, so in theory a smaller charged particle should be able to move through a tunnel or a tube that a larger water molecule can fit through, but because they have different charges and these proteins are selective, they're not going to be allowed to move through the same protein channels. So, on the surface of a membrane, you're going to have tons of different channel proteins, all of which have their own specific selective um, molecule. Okay, And so it kind of brings up that idea of substrate and enzymes, and how enzymes only act in the presence of the correct 100% exact match uh, enzyme substrate. These are the same way. Right, where, where the membranes that are in the bilayer are going to be selective based on size and charge. Um, transport proteins sometimes use ATP energy to move materials against the concentration gradient, and that is an active transport process. One of the examples we're going to talk about later on is the sodium-potassium pump. And when you hear pump, you typically think of like actively pumping something, like a water pump is going to actively require... Um, or actively pump water. 
And any time you actively pump something, it's always going to require energy. I mean, you always have to pump water by turning the pump on, or you, you, know, you always have to plug a pump in before you can pump water. Um, if it's a channel, channel protein, then the substances that are moving through the channel protein typically always flow from a high concentration to a low concentration, meaning it's going to be a basically a diffusion osmosis or facilitated transport process, and it's not going to require energy. But um, transport proteins are typically going to require energy, and they're, um, it's an active transport process, requires ATP. Channel proteins do not require energy. Marker proteins are another type of protein that are going to be on the surface of the cell, and specifically glycoproteins are the protein that act as a name tag, and so I say here it used to identify a cell. Um, and they're called glycoproteins. If we break that word down, glyco is a prefix that means sugar, like glycogen or glucose, and protein obviously means protein, and so this is a sugar attached to a protein. These glycoproteins are marker proteins that are used to identify a cell and act like a name tag for that cell. So if we look at this picture, Notice that there are a bunch of things going on, and in class you're going to be instructed to draw a cell membrane, and we're going to talk about it in terms of a fluid mosaic model analogy. But there are several components to this that you have to include, and if you notice here, this is a glycoprotein. Okay, We've got large glycoproteins, we have small glycoproteins. This would be a large glycoprotein. Now you don't necessarily need to know size, whereas this is a surface glycoprotein, and these are small glycoproteins, and these are large glycoproteins, just know that if it contains these carbohydrate chains that are attached to the surface of a protein, it is always a glycoprotein of some size. This is the glyco portion. This is the protein portion. Together, it makes a glycoprotein. These are obviously the phospholipid heads. These are obviously the phospholipid tails. They are oriented just like we've always drawn the cell membrane where the tails are pointing in towards each other. These little kind of yellow, orange, brown structures are the cholesterol. And cholesterol is found in animal cell membranes. Um, and so they add structural integrity to the membrane. Uh, it's like the mortar between bricks. You can stack a bunch of bricks up to create what is, I guess, a, a, bro, a brick wall. But if you don't put mortar between the bricks, then the brick wall is not going to be that strong, and you probably could just push it over with one hand, right, due to gravity. Um, but these add the mortar between these bricks, so to speak, and so they are really important in adding the integrity to the membrane. Now, we also are going to have, and they're not necessarily shown in this picture, but we're going to have channel proteins. We're going to have the integral proteins, which are basically these surface proteins, um, and so we'll, we'll draw a more specific diagram later on. But just know that there is a difference between the proteins and the, the lipids, and, and they orient themselves like this. So what does it mean to talk about the cell membrane in terms of a fluid mosaic model? Fluid mosaic model means that the cell membrane components are randomly assigned in a position in a random pattern. Um, if we talk about fluid mosaic, or if we talk about a mosaic in art, remember that a mosaic is just like a big picture that is made up of individual tiles or individual glass pieces or individual smaller paintings or drawings, and when put together in a random pattern, it creates a bigger composition. Well, the membrane is the same way. We have all these individual components, and the phospholipids and the cholesterol and all these different proteins come together to produce this big mosaic art piece that um, that surrounds every entire or surrounds the entire cell, but it also surrounds every cell, both prokaryotic and eukaryotic. Um, I think that's where we'll end it today, Mr. P. See you.